Hey everyone, we're Nick and Rachel. If you're new here and haven't been following our adventures over the past year, you'll typically find us vlogging our travels around the world. But today's video is going to be a little bit different. As we travel through various different countries, we've noticed some things are a little bit different than what we're accustomed to back home in Canada and the UK. The reason that we have this channel is to share our experiences in the hope that that will also inspire you to do the same. However, we do completely understand that not all countries are made alike. So with that, we wanted to provide you with some helpful tips and tricks for each of the countries that we visited so that if you were to go and do the same itineraries that we have, you'll feel as best prepared as possible. Today's video is going to focus on traveling through India. If you've been watching our videos, you'll know that we went to Delhi, Agra, Jaipur, Jodhpur, Mumbai, and Goa while we were there. Because we spent quite a bit of time in India, we also have quite a list of pointers to get through today. Some of the tips and tricks will be specific to the country as a whole, while others will be city specific. We hope you find these useful. When we were first considering coming to India, then one thing that we had heard from a lot of people, and these were a lot of horror stories, was with regards to getting a visa to enter India in the first place. It had a reputation for being a lengthy and very costly process just so that you would get in. However, as we started traveling around the world, we ended up finding out that when we came to applying for an Indian visa, they had just instituted an e-visa system. And this was a means to reducing the waiting times, streamlining the process, and just generally making things cheaper and easier for anybody who wants to visit. And that's exactly what we found. It did take us some time to actually go through the e-visa application process. I would say definitely set aside a couple of hours so that you can do it 100% right. But thankfully, while some of the phrasing of the questions may be a little bit confusing, there are guides available to help you through that process and make sure that you're providing the information that they are after. Once we'd gone through all of that, then the actual cost of the application was 10 US dollars per person, which is phenomenally cheap for entry. And the turnaround time in comparison to the weeks and months that we had heard from other people prior to this process was within 24 hours. We were absolutely flabbergasted. So we presented the documents that they asked us to print out upon arrival and after about 10 minutes, then it was all taken care of and we were welcome into the country for 30 days. Some cities in India do have a metro or subway line. We used the metro in Delhi, in Jaipur, and in Mumbai. The most extensive subway system is definitely in Delhi and once we discovered it, we really used it as a mode of transportation because it took us to almost every tourist attraction we wanted to go to or very close to it. And it is so much cheaper than getting an Uber or negotiating a tuk-tuk ride. Also, you can get the subway from Delhi airport right to their main railway station. So that is a really convenient way to get into the city. Now the subway system in Jaipur is not as extensive, but there is a subway station close to the main railway station in Jaipur. So that's a really easy way to connect into the central part of Jaipur as well. And in Mumbai, we actually walked a lot there. However, the metro system there is pretty extensive and I do think you can get around pretty well using it. As I mentioned before, it is really cheap, it is safe, it is clean. To give you an idea, all of the metro or subway systems have air conditioning, so it's so comfortable. Just be aware that sometimes when you emerge from the airport or a main railway station, or you're heading towards a subway station, the tuk-tuk drivers might approach you and say, you know, oh, I'll give you a better price than the subway. Or they might tell you, you know, the subway stop is closed or that it's not running today or it doesn't go there. None of those things are true. All you really need to know is that it is a very reliable service and trust Google. 
As you go through India, then typically your main mode of transport, aside from metro lines and potentially buses, will be rickshaws, aka tuk-tuks. Uber is technically available, but in our experience, it's really something that is only used for travel by car. There is an Uber Auto function which is aimed at getting you a rickshaw, but every time we tried to use that, then we were unfortunately unsuccessful. So that is definitely something to bear in mind. Equally, not a lot of drivers appear to use it, so even when it comes to the car aspect, then you may end up finding that you request something, you're waiting for five minutes and nothing happens. So everything gets canceled. So with that, Uber unfortunately is not really your friend in terms of getting you a ride. However, one thing we did find it was useful for was quoting us an appropriate price whenever we did need to hop on a rickshaw or get a taxi somewhere. For that, then basically we just input the place that we were trying to go and we took that price as gospel and we used that as a negotiation tool for any tuk-tuk driver that wanted to take us to that place. And that ended up meaning that we got some very reasonable rates. So we would thoroughly recommend that if you're planning on doing that, you do the same thing. Train travel in India is really great. And for this, we're talking about intercity travel between two different cities. Make sure that you book your train in advance. Now you can try and do this independently, but you will need an Indian SIM number in order to do that. We didn't have one and we discovered that simply asking our accommodation for help was really the most efficient way to go about booking train travel. They would just book it for you and add it to your total bill and you would pay them cash. We did use a travel agent once that was just across the street from our accommodation, but all of the locals and people working in tourism were really happy to help us with booking train travel. They will also ask you what class you want to travel in. Make sure that you go for the class that has air conditioning for the most comfortable experience. Another note is that we were told that trains in India were notoriously late. We actually did not experience that. We found them to be quite reliable and on time. But I think the reason for that is because we always made sure we took the first train out first thing in the morning. And I think that if you use that strategy, you probably are less likely to encounter any problems. To follow on from that point, with train travel, we really only used it for journeys that maybe would only take up to about five hours at a time. And that was a very comfortable experience. However, when we were trying to go from the north of the country further south to Mumbai, where it would have been a much longer journey, nearly a day in certain instances, then that's when things start getting really expensive because you then have to factor in the likes of sleeping cabins and all of that kind of thing. And so actually, while it is 100% an option, if you want the experience of doing that, then you're more than welcome to do so but it may actually be more economical for you and also more effective for your time to get an internal flight within India. There are a number of low cost carriers in India that can get you from point A to point B. We used Indigo for the majority of what we needed to do and it shook out to be very, very good. We were very happy with the service. Security at Indian airports is very stringent. They ask you to take out all your electronics, and by that I mean including every single cord that you have. India as a society is almost exclusively cash based. If you are going to come to India exclusively, then it may be worth getting your rupees ahead of time. And the reason for this is because while there are ATMs and they are dotted around most of your major cities, they may not always work even if your card is universally accepted. The reason for this is because they do have a habit of running out of money at times and they do have to be constantly refilled every day. So with that, then you may have to shop around at different ATMs in order to get your cash out. And also it's probably worth going sometime in the early afternoon, sort of around 2 p.m. to 3 p.m. because at that point it's more likely there'll be cash in there because that's when they usually restock the cash in each ATM. Once you do have that cash though, it is always advisable to keep 
all of your valuables very much hidden and on your person at all times. As with anywhere else in the world, it's always possible to lose things. Pickpocketing can happen in certain cities as well. So with that, just be careful. The water in India is not potable. This means that you definitely cannot drink it. You're gonna have to buy bottled water. And again, like most other countries where this is the case, bottled water is very cheap and affordable. However, unlike the countries that we had previously visited, in India, you cannot brush your teeth with the drinking water. Now, this isn't to say that their water is bad. It's just not good for Western stomachs because we're not used to it. Similarly, I'm sure they may have problems if they came to the UK and Canada. It's just what your constitution grows up with. There are water stations in every city, but again, as a tourist, you should not use them because your stomach will not be able to handle it. So just beware, buy your bottled water and use the bottled water to brush your teeth as well. In the same way, then this does also carry over to the likes of street food. So it is definitely worth being a little bit careful about this because when it comes to a number of these things, then a lot of the products are going to be washed with that same water, which upsets a Western stomach. With that, it's definitely best to make sure that anything that you buy is very much cooked through. If it's got water in it, then that water is very much boiled off. And generally speaking, just as a best practice is always best to make sure that you watch the thing that you're buying being cooked in front of you first. That said though, street food, generally speaking, is probably the cheapest option that you're going to see all the way through India, and we can definitely say from experience, it is delicious. And to be fair though, even if you opt to go more for a sit-down restaurant option, the food quality is going to be superb and incredibly cheap. I think in most places that we went, we spent no more than $5 for the two of us on one meal at a time. As Nick was saying, eat only vegetables and meats that have been well cooked. And that does mean that you're probably gonna have to avoid salads because again, that will have been likely washed with water that maybe isn't suitable for our stomachs. As for fruit, as long as there's a peel on it, you could probably eat that quite safely. But the problem is when it comes to the smoothies that are sold on the street. Oh my goodness, they look absolutely delectable. And in the heat, you're gonna be like, yes, this is what I want right now. However, if there's fruit in it that doesn't have a peel, that could be problematic. And the fruit could have been washed with water that isn't bottled. So that is why it's probably best to avoid juices as well as smoothies. That all said though, when you do make all these considerations and you do jump through these hurdles, then what you're treated to is some of the best food in the world. And we do 100% maintain, it is worth enjoying. And certainly if you've had anything to do with an average meal in India, you've been extremely unlucky. We're very sorry. It is worth noting that actually the cuisine overall is predominantly vegetarian, but if you do want meat options, then there is no beef. Cows are sacred in the Hindu religion, and so therefore they are just not available on the menu. And because most of the rest of the population in India is Muslim, then there are no pork products available either. So with that, your options, generally speaking, are chicken, lamb, and fish. However, in comparison to the vegetarian options, then the non-vegetarian options do have a premium because you are throwing the meat or fish into it. So that is just something to bear in mind. Expect to eat all of the delicious Indian food with your hands. Cutlery is very rare, but they will provide it sometimes when they see you, or you can just ask for it if you're not comfortable eating with your hands. Also, because that is the custom, all the restaurants provide a hand washing station and you are expected to wash your hands before and after the meal. One of the things that we definitely got into while we were in India was chai. The tea culture in India is absolutely amazing. They obviously grow it in the country to begin with anyway, and the quality that you get is superb. What we really enjoyed was what they call masala chai, so basically a spiced tea, and it was always maybe sort of 10, 20 rupees, which is way under a dollar every time that you wanted one and it tasted absolutely phenomenal. 
So with that, it's always a good option if you are a hot drink person to go for that kind of thing, because it will definitely be a lot cheaper than any coffee option you'll find. To go along with our recommendations with regards to Indian food, it's probably worth just throwing out a few suggestions on some of the best stuff to get there in our experience. Obviously we did enjoy masala chai, which is technically not a food, but it is definitely worth enjoying. But the main things are, in some cases, things that you may have heard of, like samosas, for example, but the likes of pakoras, aka bhajis, kachori, naans, every kind of curry in existence. Like, there are so many good vegetable curries that they offer there. Either that or it will be curries made with paneer, which is their type of cheese, and it's very, very nice indeed. Otherwise, biryani, which is just a plain rice dish, which is still absolutely packed full of flavor and it's wonderful. And finally, chat put into a yogurt sauce, like a sweet yogurt sauce, and you get um, then an additional sauce over the top, and it's just this amazing blend of savory, sweet, and spicy all in one, and it's possibly one of the nicest things I remember having in India. And if you want dessert, I do have one thing to add. Jalebi. Oh yes. Kind of like a funnel cake, that's all I'm saying. Jalebi and lassies. Mmm, lassies. Mm -hmm. Definitely worth giving a go. So try them and thank us later. I think a lot of people are afraid of Indian food because they think, oh, it's too spicy. However, the locals told us that in most homes, they actually cook the food quite mild because even in their own families, everyone has a different preferred spice level. So by cooking the food mild, it allows everyone in the family to be able to add spice to get it to their perfect spice level. Cows are everywhere in India. You will just see them sitting on the side of a road beside the street food vendors and the market stalls. Now, they are considered sacred in India and they're pretty much untouchable. Although Nick has told me that apparently it's good luck to pet one. So if you're not scared and they're not gonna hurt you, then maybe, I don't know, we didn't do it. However, along with the cows, their droppings are also everywhere. So. Be mindful of where you step. In addition to the cows, there are a lot of stray dogs and cats in India, and they look very cute, and my animal loving heart just bleeds for them. And they do come in quite the array of friendliness, so just be a little bit cautious. One of the things that we did, and we thoroughly recommend that you do, especially if you're in Mumbai, is to go and see a Bollywood film. We went into the Bollywood cinema not really knowing anything about what to expect, but what we were treated to was three and a bit hours of just non-stop joy and fun. It was a really, really cool experience and really unlike anything else that we've ever been to before. Typically, the films would last around three hours. There is an intermission as well. And so really it's more like going and seeing a musical theater production, but it's just on screen instead of live action. Seats to go and see a Bollywood film are also pretty darn cheap. So if you want a good way to spend the best part of an afternoon or an evening, this is a really good way to do it on a budget. One of the things that we had been told before we went to India is that the locals will often ask to take pictures with the tourists, and this rumor proved to be true. It usually happens when you're at a tourist attraction. One of the locals will approach you and ask if they can take a photo with you, and if you say yes, this will typically lead to not only taking a photo with the person asked, but perhaps each member of their family, as well as a group shot, and then other people who had maybe been a little bit shy about asking for a photo will then also line up. Now, these people are so kind, they are so friendly, there's nothing to be scared of. They have like no bad will or intentions whatsoever. And so we found that even striking up a conversation or trying to was really fun because even if their English wasn't that great, they really tried and they were just genuinely curious and really happy and thankful that we agreed to take a photo with them. 
For all of those lovely people who do ask for photos though, then there may be a number of people who will come up to you and ask you for money. And in those scenarios, they may be somebody just casually striking up a conversation or they may be outright coming to you with their hands outstretched. Just know that you are more than entitled to say no and walk away from that conversation. There is no pressure for you to actually provide them with money if you do not feel comfortable doing so. Just like in China, India has a huge population. So by nature, there is overcrowding and I think that's what leads to a lot of the poverty they have there. Some people may find it completely overwhelming to be surrounded by so many vehicles and tuk-tuks and people, but those who thrive in high energy environments will absolutely love it. If you're not one of those people, I think that this can be easily rectified by just ensuring that your accommodation is a quiet haven for you to retreat to. Bearing this in mind, it is 100% worth looking into when you book your accommodation that you have the amenities that you need to make your stay as comfortable as possible. So with that, whether it's air conditioning, a private bathroom, or something else, then just make sure that all of that is included in the listing prior to you booking. As with many of the other countries that we have done these tips and tricks videos for, India is another one where you will have to ask your accommodation for toilet paper unless you want to, as you so put it yesterday, the bum gun or just the hose beside the toilet which acts essentially as a bidet. Definitely when you're out at tourist attractions you will not have the option of toilet paper so if you do want some you should just bring some with you in a little bag. Now for a little bit of location specific advice. When you're in Agra, obviously the major thing that you can see is the Taj Mahal. And I cannot even begin to tell you how incredible it was for us to go and see it. However, there is also another site there called the Agra Fort, which we would also recommend giving a look if you plan on staying in Agra for a couple of days. Tickets for both of these attractions can be bought in advance online. However, rather than having to buy individual tickets, which is an option, what you can do to save money is actually buy a combined ticket, which provides you with entrance into both sites. So just a little tip there for if you want to save a little bit of added money while you're in Agra, because certainly the Taj Mahal is probably the most expensive thing that we ended up seeing while we were in India. Buses between Jaipur and Amber Fort are available and by far the cheapest way to get between the two locations. There's both a tourist bus as well as a local bus. I believe they go from the same spot. We turned up and just hopped on the first bus that arrived. It turned out to be the local bus, which was great because it was actually cheaper than the tourist bus, but also it was a really interesting experience. The locals were all very friendly and helpful, and uh, I think they were curious about us because they stared at us a lot. Of the cities that we ended up going to, it is worth noting that there was only one that was truly walkable for us, and that was Jodhpur. There are actually a lot of narrow roads and streets and alleyways that make it actually inhospitable for the likes of vehicles to go down. So with that, the only way that you can get around in most instances, unless you're in the city center, is to walk it. However, Jopur is really a unique case in terms of the places that we visited. The majority of the rest of them are very, very sprawling. And so unless you are in the middle of everything that you want to be seeing, it is highly unlikely that you're going to want to walk there because it may be at least an hour away on foot. Goa has a very low season, and that is during monsoon season. So before you plan a beach vacation, to Goa, it's best to make sure that it's not during monsoon season because the waves will be so big that it is dangerous to swim and then it might be raining a lot more than normal. You won't be able to go to the beach. Also because it really closes down during this time, some of the restaurants and cafes won't be open. So it's best just to check to see when their high season is so that you have access to all the amenities and can really enjoy your time there. 
And that brings our list for India to an end. We do recognize that this was a very long one, so thank you for your patience and thank you for sticking with us. But even with all of these points, we still completely recognize we have not covered everything. So if you have any questions or you have additional recommendations, then feel free to leave us a comment below. Until next time though, take care. And keep smiling.